after the flood, and after Noah and his sons and their wives went forth from the ark, there was a man begotten by his grandson Cush, whose name was Nimrod. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which means confusion. The name Nimrod means rebellion. Nimrod was a rebel against God, and as the leader of the kingdom of Babel, Nimrod was also connected with the building of the Tower of Babel. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. According to the historian Josephus, Nimrod said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. The motive for building the Tower of Babel, according to Josephus, was to protect humanity against another flood. Before the flood, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When God saw that the children of men were building a tower in rebellion against him, he wanted to put an end to it and said, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. Tradition says that Nimrod's wife was also his mother and granddaughter of Noah. According to various legends, Semiramis became pregnant after engaging in an adulterous affair while married to Nimrod. Around this time, Nimrod dies a violent and untimely death. In an effort to retain power and to hide her misdeeds, Semiramis makes the most audacious claim. She publicly declares that upon Nimrod's death, he had been resurrected as the god of the sun. As the sun god, Nimrod used his sun rays to miraculously inseminate Semiramis with a child. This child was thus considered to be divinely conceived. The child's name was Tammuz, which she claimed was the reincarnation of Nimrod. Thus, Semiramis was both Nimrod's wife and mother. After the scattering that occurs at the Tower of Babel, the story of the miraculous conception of this child disseminated throughout the world and led to the rise of sun worship along with the various birth, death, and rebirth cults that are littered through history. These mystery religions of future generations adopted different names for Nimrod, Semiramis, and their child, Tammuz. This was the birth of paganism. The Egyptian Book of the Dead. Now, if you were anything like me, you probably loved to study mythology, and this book might have been your introduction to false gods and goddesses. You have Isis and Horus from Egyptian mythology, which most atheists will say is an older version of Mary and Jesus Christ. And of course, you have other Mary-like and Christ-like deities in other mystery religions, such as Norse mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and Babylonian mythology that predate Christianity. Why is this so? How was it that there were so many virgin birth religions around the world way before the Christ was even born into humanity? This was the question I've asked myself many years ago. The thing is, the birth of pagan religions came about after the flood, but the prophecy of a virgin birth was declared by God way before that time. In Genesis 3 verses 14 and 15, soon after Satan had succeeded in causing Adam and Eve to sin, God declared to him his fate. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God told the serpent that the seed of the woman will bruise his head. Now in every case, 
the seed always comes from a man which enters the woman, thus the conception of a baby. The enemy knew that this was not to be an ordinary seed and that this was not to be an ordinary birth. He knew that it would be a virgin birth. And so he devised a plan through Semiramis and fathered these counterfeit virgin birth religions throughout the ancient world along with the worship of the sun in God's stead. This he did to put doubt in the minds of people by questioning out of all these counterfeits which Jesus story is the authentic. And so today we have atheists ridiculing Christians saying we don't know what we believe because there are so many religions with a story similar to Christ's. Little did they know these false religions were set up by Satan to promote false worship and idolatry. So how do we know if God truly does exist? And how do we know which God is the authentic? My name is Tilla. And I believe that Bible prophecy is one of the many strong evidences that God does truly exist and that the God of the Bible is the one true God. To declare over 2,500 years of human history in pinpoint accuracy, years before it even started coming to pass, is nothing ordinary. And Daniel's account is a very interesting account. The book of Daniel was written about 600 years before the time of Christ. The entire book was written by Daniel the prophet himself except for chapter 4 which was written by King Nebuchadnezzar. The name Daniel comes from a juxtaposition of two words, Elohim meaning God and Dan meaning judge. The name Daniel means God is judge. The story of Daniel began in a tragedy. God's people have been disobedient to God's law, and since they were stubborn and disobeyed, God had to send them adversity. The nation of Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem and carry away some of their finest and best young people into Babylon where they were trained in the customs, societies, government, and culture of the Babylonians. Daniel was one of those who were trained to be among the wise men or magicians in Babylon. Now in Daniel 2, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had a dream that disturbed him from his sleep and he had a sense that the dream was important but he forgot what the dream was about. So he called the Chaldeans. These were some of the wise men of Babylon and asked them to tell him what the dream was and its interpretation. The king was asking them to read his mind. This was impossible. But remember, he pays these wise men to know things that normal people wouldn't know. So he expected them to know the dream and its interpretation. The king was furious to have learned that these wise men could not do what they said they could do. And so he ordered the death of all the wise men in the courts of Babylon. Daniel was one of those to be put to death. When it came time for Daniel to be killed, he asked, why the decree was so urgent. One of the king's guards, Arioch, made it known to Daniel the reason why. And so Daniel petitioned for time so that he and his Israelite friends could pray about the dream. In verse 19 of Daniel 2, the Bible says that God gave Daniel the dream in a night vision. So Daniel boldly met with the king to tell him what the dream was and that most importantly, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and alone can interpret the dream. And the dream was this. King Nebuchadnezzar saw a giant statue with the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet and toes, partly of iron and partly of potter's clay. Then a stone was cut out without hands and struck the statue on its feet and crushed the whole statue completely. And then that stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. So with the help of God, Daniel declares to the king what his dream was and tells the king the interpretation. Now you can find Christian books out there that will tell you that this statue is the European Union or the United Nations, 
But what did the Bible actually say? Starting in verse 37 of Daniel 2, Daniel reminds the king how glorious his kingdom was, and then he says, you are this head of gold. The head of gold is King Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon. Then Daniel says that after the kingdom of Babylon, a kingdom of silver shall arise, and then after that, a third kingdom of bronze shall rule the world, and then a fourth kingdom of iron shall shatter them all, and that fourth kingdom shall be divided. So what Daniel was trying to say is that this great big statue was a timeline, and each metal represented a kingdom. Daniel says that Babylon was this head of gold and that those other metals after gold represent the soon coming world ruling empires that will conquer after Babylon. Who then was the chest and arms of silver? Well, who conquered Babylon? Despite Nebuchadnezzar's desires and ambitions, Babylon did not continue forever. It was eventually conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, led by Cyrus the Great, who ruled from 539 BC to 331 BC. Medo-Persia was this chest and arms of silver. Who conquered Medo-Persia? It was of course the Macedonian Alexander the Great who led the Kingdom of Greece which ruled the world from 331 BC to 168 BC. Alexander was one of the greatest military minds of all time and an interesting fact, Greek weapons were made out of bronze. Greece was this belly and thighs of bronze. Who conquered Greece? On June 22nd, 168 BC, at the Battle of Pydna, the empire of Alexander the Great, 144 years after his death, perished under the iron monarchy of Rome. In verse 40 of Daniel 2, Daniel says that this fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron can break and shatter everything in pieces. Iron can crush gold, silver, and bronze. Rome was the greatest empire of antiquity. Jesus Christ was nailed to a Roman cross in 31 AD. Jerusalem was sacked by the Roman army in 70 AD. The legs of iron was Rome. Who conquered Rome? Verse 41 of Daniel 2 says that this fourth kingdom will not be conquered as much as it shall be divided. We now know that the fourth kingdom was Rome. If we go down history and find that Rome was indeed divided and not conquered, then we cannot deny the truth that this book that declared it from the past is a supernatural book. So was Rome conquered or was Rome divided? Rome was, in fact, not conquered from without, but was divided from within. By 285 AD, the Roman Empire had grown so vast that it was no longer feasible to govern all the provinces from the central seat of Rome. The Emperor Diocletian divided the empire in half, with the Eastern Empire governed out of Byzantium, later known as Constantinople, and the Western Empire governed from Rome. Not only was Rome divided in half, but from 351 AD to 476 AD, Rome was picked apart and divided even more by 10 barbarian tribes, which became 10 countries in Europe. Divided Rome is the feet partly of iron and partly of potter's clay. Now I thought it was interesting that Rome was divided into 10 countries at the feet era of this prophecy. Is it a coincidence that feet have 10 toes? Very, very interesting. Who are these 10 tribes? The Alemanni today are the Germans. The Burgundians are the Swiss. The Franks are the French. The Lombards are now the Italians. The Saxons became the English. The Suevi today are the Portuguese. The Visigoths are now the Spanish. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals are now extinct, which was later prophesied by Daniel in chapter 7. All of these barbarian tribes today form divided Rome, or what we now call Europe. This is the feet and toes partly of iron and partly of potter's clay. 
Now verse 43 of Daniel 2 says that divided Rome will try to adhere or unite to one another, but will not be successful, just as iron does not mix with clay. Have there been efforts to unite Europe? There have been at least five who tried to outsmart God's prophecy. Charlemagne tried to recreate the Holy Roman Empire. He was unsuccessful. Charles V of Spain was unsuccessful. Louis XIV of France was unsuccessful. Napoleon Bonaparte was unsuccessful. And Adolf Hitler was unsuccessful. We cannot stop prophecy. When God declares it, it is permanent. So now we know the head of gold was Babylon, the chest and arms of silver was Medo-Persia, the belly and thighs of bronze was Greece, the legs of iron was Rome, and the feet and ten toes of iron and clay was divided Rome, which we now call Europe. Recording. The word worship means to bow down to, to prostrate to, or to submit yourself to someone or something. So when you worship God, it means you submit to Him and submit to His commands. Now in Isaiah 41, God puts out a challenge to those who oppose Him. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. You see, oftentimes, non-believers and sometimes even Christians alike, unknowingly worship themselves by submitting to their own will and their own commands instead of the commandments of God. The one true God says, prove to us you truly are God. Declare the future from here on after. God says in Isaiah 42, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So only God alone can declare the future from the beginning. In John 13 and 14, Jesus was talking with his disciples about things that must take place concerning the future. Then he says, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. So God gives us Bible prophecy to let us know that he truly is God and so that when prophecy do come to pass, we may believe. There is nothing more important to God than to save our souls. And he warns us of future events because he loves us. So now we know what the statue of Daniel 2 represents, and that each medal in the statue represents different kingdoms or different political powers. We also know that the feet of iron and potter's clay represent divided Rome, which we now call Europe. There is a secondary application to this iron and potter's clay. Now the iron represents Rome, which was a pagan kingdom, but what about the potter's clay? What is clay a representation of in the Bible? What does clay remind you of? Think of the beginning. In the beginning we know that man was made out of clay. But what does clay represent in Bible prophecy? In Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 6, God tells Jeremiah to go to a potter's house and there he found a potter at work and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Then the Lord said, O Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God was talking to the house of Israel, his church, and tells them that he forms his church like the potter forms the potter's clay. So in this imagery, God describes himself as the potter and God describes Israel, which is his church, 
as the potter's clay. Isaiah further describes this in chapter 64 and verse 8, where he says that the church is the clay and God is the potter, and that the church is the work of God's hands. So God then symbolically formed the church with potter's clay. This is very familiar imagery. We can find that in the very beginning a similar thing happened with the creation of man. In Genesis 2 and verse 7, God forms man, his body, out of the dust of the ground. The Hebrew word that Moses used for dust is the word afar, which means clay. And then God breathed into man the breath of life. Now in the Bible, the breath of life is also called the spirit. The word spirit in the Bible is the Hebrew word ruah, which means breath or wind. So we have God forming man's body out of clay, and he breathes in him the breath of life or spirit or wind. In Colossians 1 verse 18, we learn that Christ is the head of the church, and the church itself was called the body. And remember, God said that he forms the body of his church out of potter's clay. In Acts 2, at the day of Pentecost, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the church with the Holy Spirit. God breathed into the church the Holy Spirit. So, in the beginning, we have God forming man's body out of clay and then he breathes in him the spirit or the breath of life or the wind, which gave Adam life. And now we learn that God forms the body of his church out of potter's clay, which Christ is the head, and then God breathed into the church at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, described as a rushing mighty wind, and the church became alive and fully functional to do God's work. This is very interesting parallel. So back to Daniel 2. What is the secondary application for the potter's clay in this prophecy? We now know that it is the church, and since the potter's clay is at the feet era of the statue, which is the pagan Roman era, then it cannot be the Old Testament church. It must be the New Testament Christian church, because this was formed and became alive during the day of Pentecost, which came after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ when Rome was in power. In Daniel 2 and verse 41, Daniel writes that the Iron Kingdom, which is pagan Rome, will be divided and that this same potter's clay in the pagan Roman era will begin to mix with iron. Remember, the iron in this prophecy represents the political power of Rome. So then the Christian church will begin to mix with the Roman state. And not only will the Christian church begin to mix with the political power of Rome, but the church will also begin to mix with the pagan beliefs of Rome. How do we know? Well, every kingdom represented by each metal in this prophecy have been pagan kingdoms. Babylon, as well as Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome were all pagan kingdoms. So not only will this divided Rome be a union of church and state, but it will also be a union of Christianity and Roman paganism. And Daniel says that this will be the ruling power in the feet era of the statue, the Church of Rome. Is this accurate in history? Did the Christian church begin to mingle with not only the Roman state, but also Roman paganism? In AD 306, Constantine became the new Roman emperor by fighting a series of civil wars and he believed that it was the Christian God that helped him conquer. As history explains, Constantine received a vision from God and that an angel had told him that in the sign of the cross he must conquer. Now, we don't know if his conversion was genuine, but Constantine became a supposed believer of the Christian God. During Constantine's reign, Christians went from being a persecuted sect to openly holding positions of influence in the courts and palaces of kings and governors. So if you wanted to advance in the army or imperial civil service, holding a position of power, becoming a Christian will take you on the right path to do so because all the people at the top are now Christians. 
Constantine had made Christianity the religion of the state. And so by that time, Christianity had began intermingling with the state, the state of Rome. And so as people in the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, they brought along with them their former pagan beliefs and practices, and Christianity became intermingled with Roman paganism. There were even pagan statues renamed after biblical characters. The statue of Jupiter was renamed Peter. The statue of Hermes is shown as Christ the Good Shepherd. The statue of the Madonna and Child was retitled the Virgin Mary and Baby Jesus. Christianity had even adopted the pagan worship of the sun on the Day of the Sun or Sunday instead of the Bible Sabbath. Christianity began to fornicate with Roman paganism. What else happened during that time period? When Constantine took his empire and moved it from Rome to Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul, he had to leave somebody in charge of the Western Roman Empire. Who did he leave in charge? None other than the Bishop of Rome. And so not only did the Bishop of Rome gain charge over the Western Roman Empire, but in 538 AD, the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian gave a decree acknowledging the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. In the same year, the Roman church state was given political, civil, as well as ecclesiastical power. The Church of Rome, or Papal Rome, which we now call the papacy, became the power in Rome the civil power, the political power, and the religious power. And so after the fall of Rome, it continued in its divided state, and it also continued as a union of church and state. So now we see the three prophetic applications of the Feet era prophesied by Daniel 2. Not only was Rome divided in half with two empires, but it was also picked apart by ten tribes and divided into ten kingdoms or ten countries. They tried intermingling to reunite divided Rome, but they were unsuccessful. They also tried mixing church and state and Christianity and paganism, but we all know that when you mix lies with the truth, it falls apart. It is truly amazing how pinpoint accurate Bible prophecy is. This must be the work of God. 2,500 years of human history declared by God 600 years before the time of Christ. We are now at the feet of this Babylonian statue. There is nothing else left after the feet except Daniel 2 and verses 44 and 45 says that in the days of these kings, God will destroy and consume these kingdoms and set up his own kingdom. And this will be a kingdom that will stand for eternity. And so, God continued to give Daniel visions. Most of those visions were of prophetic events that were on the verge of coming to pass and stretches all the way to the very end of time. In Daniel 7, Daniel was given a vision of four beasts that arise from a whirlwind out of the sea. The first was a lion with wings who receives a man's heart and then stands upright like a man. The second was a bear hunched on one side with three ribs in his mouth. The third was a leopard with four heads and with four wings of a fowl. And then the fourth was a diverse beast with ten horns and iron teeth. Daniel considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel was grieved in his spirit in the midst of his body, and the visions of his head troubled him. What could the meaning of these visions be? Daniel yearned for the interpretation. Now, when I first started reading the Bible, I started digging into Bible prophecy first. 
and I was so, so confused. I didn't know what these symbols meant, but I tried to figure it all out in my own head with my own opinions and my own understanding. Little did I know that the interpretations of these prophecies are actually found written in the Bible all along. Again in Daniel 7, Daniel receives visions of beasts in Bible prophecy. Now what is a beast a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7 and verse 17 says that these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Of course, we know that a king and a kingdom are used synonymously in the Bible because you cannot have a king without a kingdom and you cannot have a kingdom without a king. Notice that verse 23 of Daniel 7 says that the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. So in Bible prophecy, a king and a kingdom are used synonymously. Daniel 7 and verse 7 says that this fourth beast has 10 horns. Now, what do the horns on this fourth beast represent? Verse 24 of Daniel 7 says that the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. So then out of this fourth kingdom, 10 more kings or kingdoms shall arise. And again, we have a prophecy about kingdoms. In the Daniel 2 prophecy, we have four metals that represent four different kingdoms. The head of gold was Babylon, the chest and arms of silver was Medo-Persia, the belly and thighs of bronze was Greece, the legs of iron was Rome. Rome then was divided into ten tribal kingdoms in the feet era made of iron and clay. And three of those ten tribal kingdoms are now extinct. So keep that in mind. The fourth kingdom, Rome, was divided into ten tribal kingdoms. Three of those tribal kingdoms are now extinct. In Daniel 7, we have a somewhat similar prophecy. We have four beasts representing four kingdoms. And out of the fourth kingdom, ten more kings or kingdoms will arise represented by horns. And guess what happens to three of those ten horns? Daniel says in chapter 7 and verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So right when this little horn was coming up, three of the first ten horns were plucked up by the roots. Funny because three of the ten tribal kingdoms that divided Rome in Daniel 2 are now extinct. They were uprooted. It seems as if the statue prophecy of Daniel 2 and this beast prophecy of Daniel 7 are lining up perfectly. So, Daniel says that the first beast was a lion with wings. In the time that Daniel received this vision, Babylon was still the dominant kingdom of the world. Babylon had all kinds of winged lion statues in their kingdom. So Daniel probably saw these statues every day when he was in Babylon. So we can say that the first beast, the lion with wings, might be Babylon. But that's a little bit too easy. What does scripture actually say? After Solomon, Israel began to rebel against God. And so what God did is he raised up a few prophets to warn them of the coming judgment. If they don't repent and turn back to God, another nation will come to destroy them and conquer them and take away their people. God through Jeremiah in chapter 4 specifically says this, I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. God was talking about Babylon coming to conquer Israel and taking their people and marching them out of Israel and into Babylon. God describes Babylon or the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar as a lion. In Habakkuk 1 and verse 6, God describes this same scenario and says, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, talking about Babylon again, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And verse 8 even mentions that they shall fly as the eagles that hasteth to eat. 
God was describing the nation of Chaldea, which are also the Babylonians. Two of the beasts that God uses to describe Babylon was a lion and an eagle. In Daniel 7 and verse 4, Daniel says about the first beast, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked up, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So that last half of the verse says that the beast was made to stand upright like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This reminds me of another event that happened in the Bible. A couple chapters before Daniel 7 is Daniel 4 and something happens to King Nebuchadnezzar. He dreams a dream, and in this dream he saw a big tree, and all the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky gravitated towards this tree. We have reason to believe that this tree was not an ordinary tree, and that it represented a man, because verses 14 to 16 of Daniel 4 says that this tree was cut down, and then it says, let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This tree represents a man, and Daniel once again had to explain this dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel 4 verses 20 to 22, Daniel describes the tree from the king's dream and says, It is thou, O king. Daniel says that this big tree is King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And we know that King Nebuchadnezzar represents the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel 4 and verse 16 says that the king's heart will be changed from a man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him and let seven times or seven years pass over him. Verse 25 says about the king, Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will. If you read the whole chapter, you will find that this thing happened to King Nebuchadnezzar because he claimed that he himself built his kingdom and did not give credit to God. So then the king was given the heart of a beast and then he started crawling around and acting like a beast. Daniel 4 and verse 34, King Nebuchadnezzar writes, And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And so, because King Nebuchadnezzar's heart was changed, and he was given the heart of a beast, he started crawling around and acting like a beast. After seven years, King Nebuchadnezzar said that his understanding came back to him, and he started thinking and acting like a man again. Of course, he most likely regained his manly heart and also began to stand upright once again. So now, remember in the book of Jeremiah and in the book of Habakkuk, God describes Babylon as a beast. He describes Babylon as a lion and also describes Babylon as an eagle. Go back to Daniel 7. What does it say about the first beast? Again, Daniel 7 and verse 4. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked up, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So, in the Bible we have God describing Babylon as a beast, specifically a lion and an eagle, and in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, who represents the kingdom of Babylon, starts crawling around and acting like a beast because he was given the heart of a beast. And then after seven years had passed, he stands upright like a man, meaning his heart then was changed back into a man's heart. In Daniel 7, the first beast, the lion with eagle's wings, was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upright like a man and was given a man's heart. Very, very interesting. So according to the Bible, 
This first beast of Daniel 7, the lion with eagle's wings, is none other than the kingdom of Babylon. So again we have a starting point. The evidence is there. This prophecy of Daniel 7 is the same prophecy of Daniel 2, only this time God uses beasts and we are going to see that he's going to give us more details when it comes to the fourth kingdom. So let's do a little bit of a recap. In Daniel 2, the head of gold was Babylon. The chest and arms of silver was Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs of bronze was Greece. The legs of iron was Rome. The feet and ten toes of iron and clay was Rome divided in two and then further divided by ten tribes, three of which are now extinct. In Daniel 7, we again have four kingdoms. The lion and eagle's wings was Babylon. If the lion with eagle's wings was Babylon, who then was the bear? None other than Medo-Persia. The leopard with four heads and four wings comes after the bear. So then it would be Greece. And then that diverse beast that comes after the leopard must be Rome. Then verse 20 says that out of the fourth kingdom, out of this fourth beast, which was Rome, arose ten horns, three of which were uprooted by the little horn. Very, very interesting. The question now is, who is this little horn? Fortunately for us, the Bible in Daniel 7 gives us descriptions of this little horn's characteristics. All we have to do is study those characteristics and compare them with the influential powers of the world and we will know by process of elimination who this little horn entity is. But before we do all that, we must first define a few symbols. What is a beast a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7 and verse 17, talking about these prophetic beasts, says that these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Again, we know that king and kingdom are used synonymously in Bible prophecy, because you cannot have a king without a kingdom, nor can you have a kingdom without a king. Daniel 7 and verse 23, again talking about the prophetic beasts, says the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol for a political power, a kingdom, a nation, or a superpower. What is a horn a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Daniel 7 and verse 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Again, a horn in Bible prophecy is a symbol for a king or a kingdom. Habakkuk 3 verses 3 and 4, talking about God. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. So a horn in Bible prophecy is a symbol for a king or a kingdom or power. What is the Bible definition of blasphemy? In John 10, Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Then Jesus says, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. So blasphemy definition number one is when a man claims to be God on earth. In Mark 2, Jesus meets a man who was sick with the palsy and Jesus says to the man in verse 5, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. In verses 6 and 7, there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God 
only. So blasphemy definition number two is when a man claims to have the power to forgive sin. So the two Bible definitions of blasphemy is when a man claims to be God on earth and when a man claims to have the power to forgive sin. But for Jesus Christ, this is not a problem because he himself is God. Daniel 7 says about the little horn that he will reign for a time and times and the dividing of time. A time in the Bible is a year. Times, that's two years, and the dividing of time is half a year. So that's three and a half years that the little horn will reign. Three and a half years is 42 months, and in the Hebrew calendar, there are only 30 days per month. So 42 months, 30 days each month, is 1260 days. But what is a day a symbol of in Bible prophecy? In Ezekiel 4, God makes a prophecy. He says to Ezekiel, Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of days. 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So God says that in prophecy, each day equals to a year. In Numbers 14 and verse 34, after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So again, God makes a prophecy. He says, you guys will search the land for 40 days. The only thing is that they did not search the land 40 days. They were there for 40 years. God appointed each day for a year. A day in prophecy equals a literal year. In Luke 13, Jesus used the same principle. Verses 31 and 32 says, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. See, this was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He said he will cast out devils and cure people for three more days, and then he will be perfected on the third day. The only thing is, he did not cast out devils and cure people three more days. He did it for three more years. And then at the end, he was on the cross saying, it is finished. It is complete. It is perfected. So a day in Bible prophecy equals to a year, literally. So time, times, and a dividing of time would be three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days in prophecy, which means 1260 literal years. So now that we know the keys and the definition of these prophetic symbols, let's now identify who the little horn is by its characteristics. Daniel 7 and verse 8. I considered the horns, the ten horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. What is a horn a symbol of in Bible prophecy? A kingdom. And verse 8 says that this will be a little horn, meaning it'll be a little kingdom. So characteristic number one, it will be a little kingdom. Verse 8 also says that it will come from amongst the ten horns of divided Rome, which today is called Europe. So characteristic number two, this little kingdom will come up amongst the ten other tribal kingdoms in divided Rome or Europe. Verse 24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, this is the little horn, shall arise after them. So characteristic number three, the little kingdom shall arise after Rome is divided into ten tribes, or ten kingdoms. When was the division of Rome final? 
From AD 190 to AD 476, the Roman Empire began to get picked apart by these 10 tribes and in the year AD 476, the last Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was removed from power by the leader of the Goths. Rome was fully divided in the year 476 AD. So this little horn kingdom would rise among the 10 horns of Europe after 476 AD. Daniel 7 and verse 8 also says that this little horn will pluck up three horns. So this little kingdom will uproot three of those 10 tribal kingdoms that divided Rome. That is characteristic number four. Daniel 7 and verse 24 says that this little kingdom will be diverse. So characteristic number five, the little kingdom will be diverse. In verse 8, again, Daniel says that this little horn will have a man as a figurehead. Verse 25 says that this little horn will speak great words against the Most High. Now, the word that Daniel used for great is the Hebrew word that means domineering. It means to boast or to be arrogant against the Most High. It means to blaspheme the Most High. Now remember the two Bible definitions of blasphemy. For a man to claim to be God on earth and for a man to claim to have the power to forgive sin. The little kingdom will blaspheme God. He will claim to be God on earth and he will claim to have the power to forgive sin. Daniel 7 verses 21 and 25 says that this little kingdom, this little horn, will wear out the saints and make war with God's people. That is characteristic number 8. Verse 25 says that this little horn will think to change times and laws. Now is this talking about the times and laws of America or Europe? No, because the only times and laws that the Bible recognizes are the prophetic times of God given by the Bible and the laws of God. So characteristic number nine, this little kingdom, this little horn will think to change the prophetic time of God and the law of God. Verse 25 says that he will rule over the saints for a time, times, and the dividing of time. Now remember, a time, times, and the dividing of time is three and a half years, which is 42 months, which is also 1260 days. But remember, a day in Bible prophecy is equal to a literal year. So this little kingdom, this little horn will reign for 1260 years. So again, here are the 10 characteristics of this little horn. Number one, it will be a little kingdom. Number two, it will come from among the 10 kingdoms of divided Rome, which today is called Europe. Number three, it has to come up after Rome was divided, which is after AD 476. Number four, it will uproot three of those 10 tribal kingdoms that divided Rome. Number five, it will be a diverse kingdom. It will be a very different kingdom than the kingdoms in the past. Number six, it will have a man as a figurehead. Number seven, it will speak blasphemy against God. That means he will claim to be God on earth and he will claim to have the power to forgive sin. Number eight, he will wear out the saints and make war with God's people. Number nine, he will think to change the prophetic times and the laws of God. And number 10, he will reign for 1260 years. So who could this little horn be? Who could this antichrist power be? Now I know that this is a very sensitive subject and I am not here to bash anybody or any entity or anybody who belongs to this entity. I am only here to give Bible truth and nothing else. Remember, God loves us and he gives us these Bible prophecies to warn us. Proverbs 12 and verse 1 says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Proverbs 8 and verse 33, Hear instruction and be wise, and refuse it not. 
Hebrews 12 and verse 11 says, No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God sends Bible truth to warn us because He loves us. He wants to correct us, not to embarrass us, but to direct us to the path of righteousness that we may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So then who is the little horn? It is none other than the papacy. Let's apply the papacy through the 10 characteristics given by Daniel 7. Number one. Is the papacy a small kingdom? The Vatican is one of the smallest kingdoms in the world. Number two, did it come up among divided Rome? The Vatican came up among divided Rome or Europe. It was established in Rome, Italy. Number three, was it established after AD 476? The History of the Christian Church, Volume 3, page 327. The Roman Church state power became supreme in Christendom in 538 AD due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian known as Justinian's Decree which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. It gave the Roman Church state political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. This letter became part of Justinian's Code the fundamental law of the empire and that year Pope Vigilius ascended the throne under the military protection of Belisarius. The Vatican established its power and its authority in AD 538 which was shortly after year AD 476. Did the papacy pluck up three of those ten tribes that divided Rome? The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths were three of the ten tribes that divided Rome. They denied the teachings of the Church of Rome, and so what the Bishop of Rome did is he called upon Justinian to get rid of those three tribes. And sure enough, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths are now extinct. No modern day descendants whatsoever. Number five, is it a diverse kingdom? The answer is yes. This kingdom is a union of church and state. France was a kingdom. England was a kingdom. Germany was a kingdom. But the Vatican is a church as well as a kingdom. It is a diverse kingdom. Number six, does it have a man at its head? It is the Pope. The Pope is the papacy's figurehead. Number seven, does it speak blasphemy? Now remember the two Bible definitions of blasphemy. Definition number one is for a man to claim to be God on earth. And definition number two is for a man to claim to have the power to forgive sin. Does the papacy claim to be God on earth? The Archbishop of Venice, prior to becoming Pope Pius X, says, The Bishop of Rome is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh. Does the Bishop of Rome speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. The head of this entity claims to be God on earth. It even claims to rule for God on earth. The great encyclical letters to Leo the 13th, page 304. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. This entity the papacy claims to have the authority of God. This is blasphemy. Does it claim to have the power to forgive sin? Dignity and duties of the priest, page 34. Were the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in a confessional, 
Jesus would say over each penitent, Ego te absolvo, which is Latin for I forgive you, and the priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, Ego te absolvo, and the penitents of each would be equally absolved. That means they are claiming that if Jesus forgives me of my sins and a Catholic priest forgives you of your sins, we are both equally forgiven. They are claiming the power to forgive sin. That is blasphemy. Characteristic number eight. Did it make war with God's people, the saints? The Roman church state has shed more Christian blood than any other entity that has ever existed on earth via the Inquisition. Over 100 million Christians were killed by the papacy during a period called the Dark Ages. The reason why they called it the Dark Ages was because the Bible was illegal. If the papacy caught you with a Bible in your hands back in those days, you are immediately taken in for heresy and then tortured and eventually killed. Characteristic number nine. Did the papacy think or intend to change the very prophetic times and the laws of God? Now the papacy didn't really change prophetic times and the law of God. No one can change prophecy and no one can change the law of God. The papacy thought they could and they intended to change the prophetic times and the laws of God. Now there are three general views of Bible prophecy interpretation. So far we have seen prophecy unfold in parallel to historic events, meaning prophetic time frame is laid out and history fulfills those prophecies. Prophecy said that there would be Babylon, and there was Babylon. Then Babylon would be conquered by Medo-Persia, and Medo-Persia would be conquered by Greece. Greece would then be conquered by Rome, and Rome would be divided. Now we have taken the time to study intricately the meaning of these symbols given in Bible prophecy and have found out that these prophecies line up perfectly with history. This is called the historicist view of Bible prophecy interpretation and I believe it is the true view of prophecy. When the papacy was still in power, Protestants were given light by God and they began to interpret Bible prophecy and thoroughly identified the papacy as the antichrist power mentioned in scripture. So what the papacy did is around the 1500s and 1600s, they hired two Jesuit priests to counter the historicist view of Bible prophecy interpretation to point people away from identifying the papacy as the antichrist power of scripture. Jesuit priest Francisco Ribera came up with a futurist view of interpretation which tells us that these prophecies will be fulfilled way in the future and that the Antichrist will be a man from the Middle East. This opposes the view in which these prophecies are actually taking place in parallel to history. So from this very study, we know that this futurist point of view is a false doctrine. The second Jesuit priest hired by the papacy was Louis de Alcazar, who came up with a preterist view of interpretation, claiming that these prophecies already happened in the past with Nero being the Antichrist. The problem with this is that Nero does not fulfill all of the characteristics and descriptions of the Antichrist mentioned in scripture, especially in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13. One of those descriptions, among many others, is the criteria that the Antichrist will rule for 1260 years. It is impossible for a human man in Nero to fit this description. The preterist point of view is also a false doctrine. Remember, the Antichrist shall think to change times and laws. It doesn't actually change the times and laws. These two views of Bible prophecy interpretation is an attempt to change the prophetic times of God. What about the law of God? Did the papacy think to change the law of God? Lucius Ferraris, Prompta Bibliotheca, Article Papa 2, Volume 6, Page 29. 
The Bishop of Rome is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine laws since his power is not of man but of God, and he acts as vicegerent or representative of God upon earth. In other words, we can change the law of God. The interesting thing about all this is the only law of God that is also a time is the Sabbath. And the papacy thought that it could change that law from Sabbath, which is Saturday, to Sunday. We will talk more about that later on. It is very, very important. So characteristic number nine, did the papacy think to change the times and laws of God? Yes, it did. Characteristic number 10, did it rule for 1260 years? Remember, the papacy officially gained its power, seat, and authority from Rome in the year 538 AD. In 538 AD, after those three tribes were plucked up, Justinian issued a decree stating that the Bishop of Rome is now boss. No wonder why this power thought it could change prophetic times and even the laws of God. It became power hungry and started persecuting Christians who didn't want to do what the church wanted them to do. And this is what happens when church and state unites. It was a union of church and state that persecuted and killed Jesus Christ. And it was also a union of church and state that persecuted and killed the followers of Christ. So in AD 538, the papacy became the boss. And at the year 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte became sick and tired of taking orders from the papacy and he sent one of his top generals named Berthier to arrest the Pope then claimed Rome. He took the power away from the papacy. Of course, the Roman church state would rise again later on and its wound would heal. That was prophesied by John in the book of Revelation. So again, prophecy says that this kingdom will rule for 1260 years. Let's do the math. 538 AD to 1798 AD. That equals to 1260 years. All 10 descriptions or characteristics of Daniel 7's little horn fit only one entity in this world, and that would be the papacy. And now we make it to a crucial part of biblical time prophecy, a crucial part of history. The little horn has now been identified as the papacy. It seems that with the succession of these prophetic visions, God unveils more and more in detail each time prophetic vision is presented. This brings us to the island of Patmos. This brings us to John and a revelation. The book of Revelation is a very, very interesting book of the Bible. Now, this is a book that I've read over and over again for the last eight years of my life. This book was written by John the Revelator, and in this book, he describes the visions he had seen while being visited by the Lord at the island of Patmos in his exile. When I was reading this book, I focused particularly on the scary parts because those were the things that as a young man interested me most about the Bible. In Revelation 13, John saw a vision of a beast that rises out of the sea. This beast had seven heads and ten horns, and John says that all the world wondered after this particular beast. After this beast that rises out of the sea, John saw another beast that rises out of the earth. This beast had two horns like a lamb and spake like a dragon. Now who are these beasts and what do they represent? I believe that these prophecies give us insight and most importantly warnings about events soon to take place in the near future. Revelation 13 goes on to say that these beasts will cause people to have a mark and whoever is not found with the mark cannot buy 
or sell and eventually will be killed. So the more we know, the better we are able to prepare for this coming crisis. The list of descriptions given to describe these two beasts of Revelation 13 are quite similar to the descriptions given to describe the beasts of Daniel 7. But in order to figure out who or what these beasts represent, we must first again learn more keys to unlock the meaning of the symbols that give us the clues which reveal the identity of these beasts. Let's take a look at the keys. What is a beast a symbol of in Bible prophecy? We now know from Daniel 7 that a beast is a symbol for a political power, a kingdom, a nation, or a superpower. What is the sea or waters a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Revelation 13 verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now if you go over to Revelation 17 and verse 3, John being carried away in the spirit says, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this is the same beast. And now John says that a woman is sitting on top of the beast that rises out of the sea. In Revelation 17 and verse 15, an angel tells John, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters or the sea in prophecy is a symbol for people or a densely populated area. What is a horn a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Now we already know that a horn is a symbol for a king, a kingdom, or power. What is the Bible definition of blasphemy? We've also learned from the study before this the two Bible definitions of blasphemy. Bible definition number one, when a man claims to be God on earth, that is blasphemy. Bible definition number two, when a man claims to have the power to forgive sin, that is also blasphemy. Revelation 13 says about the first beast that he will continue 40 and 2 months. Now remember, 40 and 2 months or 42 months is the same as time, times, and the dividing of time, which is three and a half years. Again, in the Hebrew calendar, there's only 30 days per month. 42 months. 30 days each month, that's 1260 days, but we also already know that a day in Bible prophecy equals to a literal year. So that 42 month prophetic period is actually 1260 literal years. What is a dragon a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Revelation 12 and verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So in the primary sense, the dragon is the devil, but there is a secondary application. Revelation 12 starting in verse 4, talking about the dragon, says, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. First of all, what is a dragon? A dragon is a beast. And remember, a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol for a kingdom. Now, who is the man-child who is caught up unto God and to his throne? That would be Jesus Christ. So, verse 4 of Revelation 12 says that this dragon, this beast, or this kingdom wanted to devour the man-child, which was Jesus Christ, or kill Jesus Christ as soon as he was born. Who was the king from the kingdom that tried to kill Jesus as soon as he was born? In Matthew 2, it was King Herod of pagan Rome that ordered to kill all of the sons of Bethlehem under two years old in hopes that Jesus would be one of those that were killed. He felt threatened by Jesus because he heard the prophecy that one day this child would take hold of rulership. 
So in a secondary sense, the dragon is also pagan Rome. Again, the dragon in the primary sense is Satan and in the secondary sense, pagan Rome. Now what is a sword a symbol of in the Bible? Ephesians 6 and verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So in the primary sense, the sword is the word of God or the Bible. Romans 13 verses 1 through 4. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Talking about the civil government, the civil power. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. So the sword in the primary sense is a symbol for the Bible. And in the secondary sense is a symbol for the civil power. Now, what is an image in the Bible? In Genesis 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Exodus 20 and verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So in the Bible, an image of something is a likeness of something. Now what is the Bible definition of worship? The word for worship in Hebrew is the word shaka, and in Greek it is the word proskuneo. These two words mean to bow down, to crouch, to revere, to prostrate to, or submit to someone or something. So the Bible definition of worship is to bow down and prostrate oneself in submission and obedience to someone or something, usually in a spiritual or religious sense. So again, here are the keys. A beast is a symbol for a superpower. The sea or the waters is a symbol for peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. In other words, a densely populated area. A horn is a symbol for a king, kingdom, or power. The two Bible definitions of blasphemy. Number one, when a man claims to be God on earth, that is blasphemy. And number two, when a man claims to have the power to forgive sin, that is also blasphemy. The 42 month period is 1260 days in prophecy, which is 1260 literal years. The dragon in the primary sense is Satan and in the secondary sense is pagan Rome. The sword in the primary sense is the Bible and in the secondary sense is the civil power. An image in the Bible is a likeness for something. And to worship means to bow down and prostrate oneself in submission and obedience to someone or something, usually in a spiritual or religious sense. So now that we know the keys, we're going to read Revelation 13, starting from verse 1. We're going to apply these keys and we will see that the first beast of Revelation 13 have very similar descriptions to that of another entity that was prophesied in one of the visions from Daniel 7. I believe that just reading Revelation 13 and verse 1, when we apply these keys, you guys will have a clear understanding who this entity is. Revelation 13, starting from verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. 
Now let's apply the keys. So John saw a beast or a superpower rise up out of the sea or a densely populated area having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy which means this superpower is going to claim to be God on earth and he's going to claim to have the power to forgive sin. This should already give you a clear indication of who this entity might be. It is a superpower that comes out of a densely populated area and he will claim to be God on earth and he will claim to have the power to forgive sin. Very very familiar. Verse number two, and this beast or this superpower which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon or Satan or pagan Rome gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So we have a superpower that comes out of a densely populated area. He will claim to be God on earth. He will claim to have the power to forgive sin and pagan Rome gave him his power and seat and great authority. Who could that be? Let's keep going. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon or obeyed pagan Rome, which gave power unto the beast or this superpower, and they worshipped the beast or they obeyed this superpower, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So now we have a superpower that comes out of a densely populated area who will claim to be God on earth and claim to have the power to forgive sin and pagan Rome gave him his power, his seat and great authority. And they worship the beast saying who is able to make war with the beast. They worship the beast that is a religious system and who is able to make war with the beast that is a political system. It is a union of church and state. Let's keep going. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So the superpower is a persecuting power. Again, he will blaspheme God. He will claim to be God on earth and he will claim to have the power to forgive sin and he will continue 40 and two months. That is 1260 days in prophecy, 1260 literal years. Now, what is the only entity in the world that fit these descriptions. I'm sure we all know who John was talking about now. Let's keep going. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, it's going to be a religious system. They worshipped the beast. I'm positive that most of you already know what entity John was describing in this prophecy here. Who is the beast? It is again none other than the papacy. The papacy is the only superpower that fits all of these descriptions perfectly. The papacy is a superpower that rises out of a densely populated area who claims to be God on earth and claims to have the power to forgive sin and we already know that pagan Rome gave the papacy its power, its seat and great authority. The papacy is a religious system as well as a political system. It is a union of church and state. The papacy blasphemes God. The papacy is the only entity in the world that ruled for exactly 1260 years. And during those 1260 years, the papacy made war with the saints and killed the saints during a time called the Dark Ages. So this prophecy is the same as the prophecies before. In Daniel 2, God gave us a timeline, the basis of this prophecy. In Daniel 7, 
God gave us the same prophecy but more detail. And now in Revelation 13, God gives us the same prophecy and even more detail. Revelation 13, starting from verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So the Bible is saying that he that leadeth into captivity, he himself shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword, the Bible and the civil power, he himself must be killed with the same exact thing, the Bible and the civil power. Now remember, the papacy ruled from 538 AD all the way to 1798 AD, which is exactly 1260 years. During those times, people used the Bible and protested against the papacy, exposing the papacy using the Bible, the sword, that the papacy was the little horn or the antichrist of scripture. And so many Christians back then protested against the papacy. This was the birth of Protestantism. What happened in 1798 AD? Napoleon was sick and tired of taking orders from the Pope and from the papacy. And so he sent General Berthier to go and arrest the Pope and claim Rome. The Pope then, who led people into captivity, he himself was led into captivity. So the papacy was killed with the sword, which was the Bible, and later died by the civil power in exile. He that leadeth into captivity, he himself must be led into captivity. He that killeth with the sword, he himself must be killed with the sword. The beast received his deadly wound. Now, of course, the papacy remained, but the power was taken away from the papacy. And so while the papacy was on its way down, John sees another beast that comes out of the earth. Revelation 13 verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now who is this new beast that comes out of the earth? Let's make a list of the descriptions the Bible gives us about this second beast of Revelation 13. Number one, it is a beast, so that means it is a superpower. Number two, this superpower rises up right when the papacy was on its way down, which is in the year 1798. So this superpower will rise up around late 1700s. Number three, notice that prophecy goes from east to west. In Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, that first kingdom was Babylon. The second kingdom was Medo-Persia, which is west of Babylon. The third kingdom was Greece, which is west of Persia. And the last kingdom was Rome, which is west of Greece. Rome then gave its seat and authority to the papacy. Where then will this lamb-like beast, this superpower, rise up out of? If we follow the movement of prophecy, it should rise up in the Western Hemisphere and not the Eastern Hemisphere, in the New World and not the Old World. So characteristic number three, this superpower will rise up in the Western Hemisphere, in the New World and not the Old World. Number four, it will come up out of the Earth, which is the opposite of the sea. The sea is full of water, and remember, water in Bible prophecy is a symbol for peoples, nations, and kindreds and tongues, or a densely populated area. If the earth is the opposite of a sea, then the earth must be a sparsely populated area. Number five, it will be a lamb-like beast. Now remember, the lamb is Christ. So it is a superpower with Christian values. It is a Christian nation with Christian principles. Now what are the two horns? Remember a horn in Bible prophecy is a symbol for kings or kingdoms or powers or you can say two principles. The first beast had ten horns and ten crowns which indicates that these ten horns or ten kingdoms had ten kings. This lamb-like beast has two horns no crowns. So it is a Christ-like nation with two Christ-like principles. 
Now, what are the two principles of Christ? In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, Jesus was being asked, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the two principles of Christ is love God and love your neighbors. This is why God specifically wrote the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone. Not one, not three. Two tables of stone for a very specific reason. The first table which contains the first four commandments describes our duty towards God governed strictly by a religious power. This is a spiritual kingdom. The second table which contains the last six commandments describes our duty towards man, our neighbors, governed strictly by a civil power. This is the civil kingdom. Now these two principles were even laid out by Jesus Christ himself in Mark 12. A group of people came to ask Jesus, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, may I see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So in context, God controls the religious power or the spiritual kingdom, and Caesar, today we call it the government, controls the civil power or civil kingdom. So the two principles are church and state and the separation thereof. This lamb-like beast is a Christian nation acknowledging the separation of two powers, church and state. Let's do a recap of the descriptions given to us about this second beast. Number one, it will be a beast or a superpower. Number two, it will come up around late 1700s. Number three, it will come up in the Western Hemisphere in the New World and not the Old World. Number four, it will come up in a sparsely populated area. And number five, it will be a Christian nation that acknowledges the two principles of Christ, church principles and state principles, and the separation thereof. What is the only Christian-based superpower that rises up in the late 1700s in a sparsely populated area in the Western Hemisphere who acknowledges church and state and the separation thereof? It is none other than the United States of America. Is America a superpower? The United States of America is actually the most influential superpower in the world today since the papacy. Did it come up in the late 1700s? 1776 was the Declaration of Independence. 1783 was the end of the Revolutionary War against Great Britain. 1787, the U.S. Constitution was framed. 1789, the U.S. Constitution was ratified. 1789 to 1797, George Washington served as our first president. So while the papacy was going down in 1798, the United States was quietly establishing its power and dominance. Number three. Did the United States of America come up in the Western Hemisphere? It is no secret that the United States of America came up in the New World in the Western Hemisphere. Even our currency states that we are established in the New World and the United States even calls this the New World Order. Number four, did the United States come up in a sparsely populated area? When America was first discovered, this continent was barely populated. And number five, 
Does the United States of America acknowledge church and state and the separation thereof? We have a constitution actually protecting the separation of church and state. The reason why our founding fathers came to America was because they were trying to detach themselves from the King of Britain and also from a king that runs both church and state, which is the Pope. This is the reason why we came up as a republic and a Protestant nation. Republicanism is a kingdom without a king and Protestantism is a church without a pope. The United States of America is the only entity in the world that fits the descriptions of this second beast of Revelation 13. And John says that the second beast, the United States of America, will begin to speak as a dragon. So by now, we are all most likely overwhelmed about what we have been learning so far. We have been seeing the interpretation of prophecy unfold and very clearly understand the intricate fulfillment of these prophecies all throughout history. Daniel 2 talks about a statue which we now know outlines the timeline blueprint of history. We've expounded upon the feet of that statue and we now know that the feet of iron and clay represents the division of Rome, the mixing of church and state, and the mixing of Christianity and paganism. Daniel 7 explains the same prophecy except God gives us more details about the end times. The little horn we now know is the papacy. We moved on to John the Revelator and God gives us yet again the same prophecy but again gives us even more details about the end times. God lets us know that the papacy receives his deadly wound and while he receives that deadly wound, America rises quietly to power. We have also expounded on the symbols that God uses to communicate to us prophetic vision. We are almost at the end. We are now at the era of the second beast of Revelation 13, which is America. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and he causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now remember, an image means a likeness of something. The Bible says the United States will make a likeness of the papacy. What was the papacy? It was a persecuting superpower that united church and state, and they persecuted Christians who did not obey their commands. This means then that the United States of America will also unite church and state and will persecute those who do not obey the commands of this soon-to-be mirror image of the papacy. And this is something that has been slowly happening in recent times. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The Greek word that John uses for mark is the word karagma. It means a stamp, an imprinted mark, or a badge of servitude. So in the Bible, a mark is an imprint or a stamp that indicates ownership. Revelation 14, starting from verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, 
and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their right hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. By reading these verses, we might have noticed something very particular about the mark of the beast, and that is, it is very closely connected to the worship of the beast and his image. Remember, to worship means to bow down to, to prostrate in submission and obedience to the commands of someone religiously. So whoever has the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their right hand directly means they are worshiping the beast by bowing down to the beast and submitting to the commandments of the beast. The beast being the papacy. So then it makes sense now why it is called the mark of the beast. This mark indicates ownership so that one can tell who belongs to the beast by the mark given in their forehead or the right hand. So if you have the mark of the beast or the signature of the beast, it means you belong to the beast, you worship him, you obey his commands and you acknowledge that he owns you and you give your allegiance to him. Now before we reveal what the actual signature or mark of the papacy is, let's ask another question. If the papacy has a mark that tells us who belongs to the papacy, does God also have a signature that he gives on the forehead or right hand, which indicates who belongs to him. Revelation 7 verses 2 and 3, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The Greek word that John uses for seal is sphragis. It means signet, signature, or a mark that indicates authenticity. So then God also has a mark or a signature, which is his seal, and it is given in the forehead of those who belong to him. In the end, people will be divided into two groups, with the main issue being worship or obedience. Those who belong to the beast, who worship and obey the beast or the papacy, are identified by the papacy's mark of authority, and those who belong to God, who worship and obey God, are identified by the seal of God. A mark and a seal are essentially the same thing. It is the sign or signature that signifies who you belong to. A seal in ancient times is the official signature of a king or anybody with authority. It displays the name, title, and territory of the authority. We still use seals to this day. For example, President Trump's seal reads Donald Trump, that's his name, President, that's his title, of the United States of America, that is his territory. Back in the time of Ezra, King Darius' seal would read Darius, that's his name, King, that's his title, of Persia, that's his territory. Back in the time of Jesus, Pilate's seal would read Pilate, that's his name, Governor, that's his title, of Judea, that is his territory. What then is the seal of God? we are going to notice that God's seal is found somewhere very specific. Remember, the official seal or signature of a king must have his name, his title, and his territory. Where in the Bible can we find God's signature? A little hint, he writes it with his own finger. Exodus 20, starting from verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Why? For in six days the Lord, that's his name, made, that's his title as the Creator, heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is that's his territory and he rested the seventh day 
wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You see, God did not have to make a seventh day, but he did so that in that day we can acknowledge who the Creator is. God made the seventh day for us to acknowledge the Lord our God was the God that created the world in six days and that everything belongs to Him. And so by keeping and observing the Sabbath, we acknowledge that we belong to God. This is why God says in Ezekiel 20 verse 12, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. And in verse 20, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. By keeping the Sabbath, we are acknowledging the sign that we belong to the Lord our God. And no, it is not just for the Israelites or the Jews because Jesus himself says that the Sabbath was made for man, not just the Jew. To worship God means to obey all ten commandments, but the seventh day Sabbath specifically is God's seal. Anybody can obey the nine commandments. Anybody from any religious group can abstain from murder. They can abstain from stealing. They can abstain from covetousness or using God's name in vain. But when you keep the Sabbath, you are acknowledging who your God truly is. You are acknowledging which God is your God. So if the seventh day Sabbath is God's seal, what then is the mark of the papacy's authority? Again, I am not here to make enemies or to shame anybody. I am only here to tell people the truth. Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. H.F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change Saturday Sabbath to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Cardinal Gibbons in Faith of Our Fathers, 92nd edition, page 89, freely admits, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scripture enforces the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholic Church, never sanctify. Again, the Catholic Mirror, official publication of James Cardinal Gibbons, September 23, 1893. The Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Our Sunday Visitor, February 5, 1950. Protestants do not realize that by observing Sunday, they accept the authority of the spokesperson of the church, the Pope. What a shocking admission. The observance of Sunday sacredness in the Sabbath's stead, the Church of Rome claims is the mark of the authority of the papacy. Sunday sacredness was first introduced to Sabbath-keeping Christians by Emperor Constantine around the time he became the first ever Pope, contrary to popular but false belief that Peter was the first ever Pope. The first day of the week was the day pagans back in those times recognized to worship their sun gods. They called it the Day of the Sun or Sun Day. So by observing Sunday instead of God's Sabbath, we are then worshiping the Pope by obeying the commandments of the Pope instead of worshiping God by obeying the commandments of God. Why is the seal of God and the mark of the beast in the forehead or the hand? Deuteronomy 6, starting from verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments 
which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. This was talking about the commandments of God. Skip over to verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. God says that these Ten Commandments should be a sign upon our hands and as frontlets between our eyes. That would be the forehead. Now what does that actually mean? Does that mean we have to go around with two tables of stone attached to our hand or our foreheads? Clearly that is not what it's talking about. The forehead represents our minds. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. So the hand represents our actions. And so those who love God will put it in their minds to worship God by obeying His commandments, including the seventh-day Sabbath, and it will show through their actions. And those who worship the papacy in their minds will obey the commandments of the papacy, including Sunday sacredness, and it also will show through their actions. Now this does not mean that those who observe Sunday today already have the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, starting from verse 15. And he, that is the second beast, which is America, had power to give life unto the image of the beast, which is the likeness of the papacy, the American union of church and state, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So America will make a likeness of the papacy, they will unite church and state, and this church and state union should speak. So what does a superpower talk about? When it speaks, it speaks laws and legislations. And that's why it says, the image of the beast, this American union of church and state, should both speak and cause, or enforce, that as many as would not worship or obey this American union of church and state should be killed. And he will cause or enforce all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so America will make a union of church and state and will legislate laws that will enforce the observance of Sunday sacredness to honor the papacy. Are we on the verge of this today? In almost all 50 states and even other parts of the world, we have a legislation called the Blue Laws. Blue Laws, also known as Sunday Laws, are laws designed to restrict or ban some or all Sunday activities for religious purposes, particularly to promote the observance of a day of worship or rest instituting the sacredness of Sunday. Blue laws or National Sunday Laws are already in the law books across America and around the world. It is already set, but is not yet being enforced. Have there been efforts to enforce this law? In fact, the enemy unseen have been subtly hinting at the enforcement of a Sunday law. In July of 2014, Pope Francis says in Catholic.org that working on Sunday has a negative effect on families. He says maybe it's time to ask ourselves if working on Sundays is true freedom. The Pope also said that spending Sundays with family and friends is an ethical choice for faithful and non-faithful alike. Catholic News Agency, August 12, 2015. Pope Francis says, Sundays are a gift from God. Francis pointed to Sundays as a particularly important time for rest because in them we find God. He stressed this in the context of his September 26th speech in Philadelphia at the World Meeting of Families. Thus, there is no doubt that stressing Sunday is high on the Pope's agenda. So Pope Francis says that Sunday is the day for family. 
But the Bible says that Sabbath is the day for family. After Adam and Eve were created, God rested with them as a family. In September 1, 2017, President Trump signed a proclamation declaring Sunday to be a national day of prayer for the state of Texas in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. How much more time and how many more disasters will it take for a president to declare a Sunday sacredness law? Revelation 14 starting from verse 9. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So in the end, those who worship and obey the papacy will have to drink the wine of the wrath of God. Immediately after the angel announces this, he announces another scene. In verse 12 he says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So those who worship the beast and obey his commandments will fall, and those who worship God and obey his commandments will endure and stand at the end. Probation is fast closing. We have seen prophecy unfold and declared events to take place from Babylon of old to America of the New World. We also have seen the worship of the sun on the day of the sun being passed down all the way from Babylon to America. Brothers and sisters, friends and family, God gave us prophecy to warn us of the coming crisis because He loves us and He wants to save us. He wants us to repent and to turn to the saving power of Christ. Will you give this a thought? Your eternal life depends on it. Praise God always. What's up, everybody? So there are some very, very important things that we need to talk about. But before we get into all that, I just want to thank everybody um, who watched this film just now. And also, I want to thank everybody who supported this film and donated for this film. Some of you made small donations. Some of you made big donations. And one of you made a huge donation. And with all these uh, donations, we were able to get the equipment that we needed for this movie. So we were able to get the 4K camera, the lens, the lighting, the computer, and the programs that we needed to edit this movie. And we were also able to pay for the animation that went into this movie. So for those of you who have donated, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God for you. Thank God for you. Because without you guys, this wouldn't have happened. And I did ask those who did donate if I can put their names at the end credits of this film. And they said no, because they wanted to glorify God instead. They wanted God to be glorified and not themselves. And so they turned me down. All of them, all of them turned me down. All of them said, don't put my name on this film. Just give the glory to God. And I respect that. I honor that. And that's why at the end of this film, you only saw end credits, all glory to God. That's all you saw. So I just want to personally thank you guys in this video from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys for making those donations. Now, we have another project coming up. I'm writing the script for it now. It's going to be called Prevail, How to Conquer Death. And we're going to go over really basic but important things. What is life truly? What is death truly? If Jesus Christ did save us from sin and death, why is there still sin and death in the world? How did Jesus Christ truly save us then? Why death? I mean, why is death the penalty? Why can it be something else? And most importantly, we're going to go over the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus. In Revelation 14, it talks about the end time people. It says about the end time people, Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So the central theme and the punchline of this upcoming film is about the faith of Jesus. 
what does it really look like? So if you guys want to donate to that project, go to schoolforprofits.tv. There's a link in the description and there's a donate button in the website. Or a second option is I am designing some shirts because some of you guys want some shirts. So I'm designing some shirts and I'm going to be selling those shirts and the proceeds and the profit that comes from those shirts are going to go towards this film. So if you guys want to support that film and want to donate for that film, you guys can do so. The shirts and the donate button at schoolforprofits.tv. Now, for the main urgent message. Some new development has come forward in recent history. Uh, this is like two weeks ago. If you guys have heard from Mr. Christopher Hudson, the forerunner 777, I'm going to link you guys to two of his videos in the description box. He has two videos explaining kind of the destruction or the beginning of what seems to be the destruction of the First Amendment. And as many of you guys know, the First Amendment states the separation of church and state. Now in recent news, and actually this whole past year, we know that President Trump is very, very closely connected to evangelical Christians and leaders of the evangelical Christian community. And we've noted in the past that he had made some speeches where it seems as if he is working with those Christian leaders when he makes decisions. Are you guys catching my drift? So some very, very serious things are happening. Some very, very serious prophetic things are happening. So we can see that prophecy is rapidly fulfilling. And we can see that President Trump's decision making are it's influenced by some of the Christian leaders out there. Now, what would happen if some of those Christian leaders who are now connected to the Pope see the disasters around us in the world today and say, look, we need to get back to God so that we can stop these disasters. We need to all come together and worship God on Sunday. You guys know that President Trump actually signed a declaration in Houston proclaiming that Sunday is now the national day of prayer in Houston. I don't know if it's every Sunday or just that one particular Sunday, but that is a step closer to a Sunday law. In Poland, Poland recently announced that by 2020, by year 2020, Sunday shopping would be banned. That means businesses would be closed on Sunday. That means Sunday sacredness. Now, we have a lot of things going on in the world today. We have natural disasters, riots, murders, killings, wars, slavery going on in, in, in uh, Libya. The world is being set and it's now on stage. It's now on stage for a national Sunday law to commence. The mark of the beast is going to be a huge, huge crisis for us Christians and for the world. So my message to you guys, my message to you guys is this. Pray for your faith to be increased. Pray for your faith to be increased and pray for strength and that God would strengthen you and pull you through this tribulation. Revelation 14 says, Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So that same faith that Jesus displayed from when he was born all the way to when he died is the same faith that we need to display. And we cannot display that on our own. We can only display that faith if we are closely connected to God. That is the only way. There is a coming crisis and we need to be prepared. Thank you guys for watching. Praise God always. Thank <laughs> you.